right, welcome to the Lowly Shepherd Podcast, version 2.0. Uh, as uh, I don't think I mentioned it last time, as you can see, I'm in uh, my, my new studio that I've got set up in a, a spare room here at the church that I've, I've set aside for this purpose. And uh, I've, over the Christmas break, got some new sound equipment, so uh, I'm getting all professional now. But uh, really looking to do something different, as I mentioned last time, looking to do something different with this podcast and... Um, I wanted to produce Bible study material that would be actually useful and accessible to, to anyone who is interested in studying the Bible in depth and really wants to dig in deeper than just sort of the cursory sort of devotional reading of things. And uh, really kind of targeting bivocational pastors, even full-time pastors, if they, you know, they're busy, busy pastors that don't have a lot of time to do the studying themselves. I really want to take um, a, a passion of mine, really reading these commentaries and sort of the latest, greatest, um, you know, scholarship that is available on these topics, uh, at least that is accessible and available to me um, that I have on hand, and uh, be able to hopefully, as, as the saying goes, be able to put the cookies on the bottom shelf in order to to take this scholarship and be able to break it down to something that you can use in the pulpit in your Sunday school classroom or even in just your daily understanding and daily reading of the Bible. And uh, and so as I mentioned before, I'm going to be starting in February, the first podcast in February, I believe that'd be February 2nd, uh, we're going to be starting a series on Ephesians, going through verse by verse on Ephesians. And uh, my Good dear friend Travis Welch, who is the director of missions of K Baptist Association, he's been on the show a number of times with us, and uh, we'll be looking. He'll be uh, joining me for that, and uh, really, sort of, we're going to sort of tag team it, and uh, I'm going to focus really on scholarly, you know, commentary, text critical issues that that you need to know about in a passage, and uh, Travis is going to focus on more of the sort of key themes and sort of pastoral devotional type things that you can take away from that. So hopefully we want to be a useful resource uh, that people can listen to this or watch the show uh, and keep it concise. We want to try to keep it in that 35 to 45 minute window. And I'm sure my wife is probably laughing at me about that now uh, as soon as she hears this, because I say that every week about my sermons, but it never seems to I never quite keep it in that range that I want to try to keep it in. But um, so hopefully that is my goal because I don't want to waste your time. I want you to be able to listen to this in, that, like I said, that 30, 35, 45 minute window uh, and be able to get the, the main bulk of the information that you need on a particular passage of Scripture. And so like I said, we're going to be starting at Ephesians in February. Um, and sort of uh, precursor to that, I wanted to spend the next several weeks talking about how to properly study your Bible. And... Um, I know that might seem like sort of a weird thing, but uh, as the more I have learned and the more longer I have pastored, I've been a pastor for almost 13 years now, uh, the more I have noticed people in the churches really genuinely just don't know how to study their Bible. Um, and uh, really the first thing to understand that there is, there, that is that there is a difference between Bible reading and Bible study. You know, reading, you can read it and just enjoy you know, it as literature, enjoy it for the words and the, uh, the beautiful things that you're getting out of it. You can find devotional application for it. It's like how this really speaks to me in this passage. Uh, and all that's great, and that's good for your devotional time and, and your, your daily reading. And we do need to daily read and do our devotion time. Um, but it's different from Bible study. Bible study, um, as one scholar put it, is mastery of the topic, mastery of the subject that you are studying. And so we want to be able to effectively understand as much as possible every aspect and element of what's going into this passage that has been written as the Word of God that has been given to us. And so as I constantly say to my people uh, in the church, is, you know, this is the Word of God. This, if we truly believe that this Bible came to us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, came to us through prophets and through men as the Word of God, why would we not want to study and know everything possible about it? And so I wanted to spend the next several weeks really delving into, you know, what does it mean to study your Bible and how can we study the Bible? And so today I'm going to cover a couple of topics. I want to talk about three general rules of thumb for Bible study, and that's what we'll get into in just a few minutes. Uh, 
And then I want to spend the last half of the segment talking about a good Bible translation. Um, you know, there are so many different translations of the Bible out there, and I get this question often, what is the best translation? And usually they'll ask me, well, Pastor, what, you know, what translation are you reading from on Sunday morning? And so I'll tell them, and I'll tell them why. And so I'm going to explain how Bible translations, English Bible translations happen, what's going on behind the scenes, how we get what we've got, and why, you know, say this passage in the King James Version is completely different from this version that I'm reading over here in the NIV. I'm going to talk about that and explain that, and then help, hopefully help you be able to pick a particular version of the Bible that works for you. And so those are the two topics that I'm going to hopefully cover today. Next week, I want to talk about context, uh, both uh, the, the immediate and, and uh, literary context of what's going on around the passage, but also the ancient historical context of what's going on and why we need to understand those things and be able to. And that's usually where a lot of the study that we do comes in, trying to understand the cultural and the historical background of what's going into that passage, uh, because we tend to read things with a modern perspective. Uh, that means, you know, from now, from, you know, 21st century, you know, American standard, and that's not where it was written. So a lot of the time we misunderstand what's been written. Even though it's in plain English, we don't understand it uh, because we're misreading what's actually happening there. And so I want to talk about context, and I'm going to talk about how to do a proper word study and how, and how words have meaning only within uh, the grammatical context of what they've got going on there. And so that'll be next week. And then uh, the, last, the last week that I'll do, the last one of this month, I want to talk about genre and the different genres of the Bible, the different methods or types of writings uh, that are in the Bible and why that matters for Bible study. And then the last part of that segment, I want to talk about some accessible, cheap, you know, budgets or, or even free uh, resources that you can use both on the internet and at your local you know, Christian bookstore that you can buy and use to help you in your Bible study. And so that's what I've got planned out for the next three weeks um, as we get into this discussion. So what I want to talk about first, and um, number one, the three basic rules of thumb for effective Bible study. All right, so there are three things that you're looking to do when you're studying a particular passage of the Bible. Number one, you want to observe. You want to observe. What does this passage say? And I usually recommend, if you're going to sit down to do serious Bible study, this is what I'll recommend to, to my congregation. You know, read the passage. Just, just sit down and read the passage three or four times. You know, whatever section, and, and usually, you know, your, your English translations, they have them divided out by, of course, chapters and numbers, and then they even have little paragraphs and uh, little chapter headings and things like that. So you can usually kind of tell where a section is. Read that section three or four times. Just read it. And then start asking questions. Start asking questions about what's going on in this passage. Who's talking? Who's the, the main character, so to speak, of this passage? What are they saying? What are they doing? What's going on with the people that they're talking to? Who are they talking to? Why are they talking to them? When is this happening? Where? I mean, you know, the whole uh, sort of journalist you know, handbook here, the who, what, when, where, and why, and how, right? You know, why is all, why are, what's going on in this passage? Why are all these things going on? So you start asking those questions. And, you know, a lot of times you'll be able to answer, well, who's speaking here? Well, Jesus is speaking here. Who's he talking to? Well, he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees here, you know, or he's talking to the disciples here. Where are they at? Well, they're at the temple. And so you can answer a lot of those things, but some of those things are where you're going to start to have to dig into sort of the historical background. Well, who are the Pharisees? Who are the Sadducees? Well, you're going to have to study that. What does the temple, con you know, it's in you know, Solomon's colonnade, well where is that at and what does that look like? And so you can find a lot of these resources online, just you know, Google it. Um, sort of a side note, Google is really uh, one of the best Bible tools you have, believe it or not. I know, you know there's a lot of terrible things and evil things on the internet, but there's also a lot of good things. And uh, Bible study has never been more accessible <laughs> than it is now in the age of the internet with, uh, you know, you can use a Google search to find just about anything. Uh, my only caveat is be careful with what you look at because sometimes you can find some really weird stuff that's not very biblical either. Um, so just always kind of, kind of uh, you know, put a governor on that, kind of watch that when you're, when you're going to do that. So observe, ask questions. What's going on in this passage? What does it actually say? 
All right, so that brings us to the second point, interpret. So you observe, and then you have to interpret. What does this passage mean? What does this passage mean? And when we say that, what we want to ask is, what did this passage mean to its original audience? And you're going to hear me say that a lot <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. The original audience. What did it mean to the original audience? For example, as I said, we're about to do uh, the letter to the Ephesians. That's what the title of the book is, the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. So there you have it right in the title. Who is the letter written to? The Ephesians in the first century AD. So we need to know what kind of people they were. What is the culture? What is the background? What is the history of Ephesus, the city uh, in Asia Minor? What's modern day Turkey? What, you know, what is going on around them and, and what's happening and what would be, you know, what does everyday life look like in Ephesus at the time when this is written? All of that seems like a lot of people might think that's not important, but it's very important to do proper Bible study because it informs exactly what Paul is saying and why he is saying the things he is saying to them. Um, you know, nowhere is this more evident than the, the letters of First and Second Corinthians. Uh, the situation in Corinth was the the very impetus for why he wrote those two letters, and there was actually probably uh, another one, and if not two other ones. Uh, that we actually don't have in our, our biblical canon. But, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of things that he is dr uh, directly addressing that are related to cultural aspects of things that are going on in Corinth. And so you need to understand that because it's not necessarily a universal uh, situation that's going on or something that we could apply directly to us. And so we need to understand what did that mean to the audience in that time? All right. And this is where I'm going to talk about something called the hermeneutical gap. Hermeneutical gap. And I'll put a little picture up there. The hermeneutical gap. And hermeneutics is just a fancy seminary word. It's one of those what they call $6 million words. That means interpretation. It's Bible interpretation. It's, you know, hermeneutics is the entire process of what I've been talking about, observing, interpreting, and then applying the scripture to us. And so what the gap is, is the gap is between the there and then, what was happening when this letter was written to who it was written in that culture in that time, the gap from that until the here and now. And so sometimes the gap is very small. When Paul says, I always use this example, when Paul says something like, do all things without grumbling or complaining, well, that's something that applied to them and there in that time, and it applies to us here and now. We can understand pretty easily what that context and what that under, understand what that meaning is. So the, the hermeneutical gap is really small. Well, some of that stuff in the Old Testament, and I, you know, I always like to talk, toss out the book of Leviticus, you know, well, don't wear, you know, a robe made of two different fabrics. Well, there was a particular cultural, religious, social aspect of what was going on in the there and then that we have no context for today because that's not something that applies to us in our modern age. And so the hermeneutical gap is much larger there. And so we're always in Bible study trying to bridge that hermeneutical gap between the there and then and the here and now. And so that's really the, the goal of proper Bible study. So number one, observe. Number two, interpret. What did it mean to the original audience? What are the main principles of what I'm trying to get out of this passage? You know, what was the main point? What was the main key themes that are being brought out in this passage. And that brings us to the third point, which is in some ways the most important, the application, apply the passage. How then should I respond to what I have read? Okay. And a lot of times, you know, we want to, when we do Bible study, I mean, all this other stuff, you know, what does it say? Doing all that historical cultural background is very, very interesting stuff. But if we're doing it just to have the head knowledge of all this cool stuff that was going on and like, hey, I like history. So that was some, hey, that was kind of cool. That's an interesting point that this was something that was going on there. But if we don't do anything with that, it's pointless. It means nothing. The Bible is not meant just to study in the sense that we want to have head knowledge about things. The Bible was meant to study in order to be able to apply it to our life, to be able to use it and to change how we live and so that we would live according to what God's Word says. So if we're not applying the passage, then we're, we're missing out on probably the most important aspect of proper Bible study.
So how do we apply it? Well, you take what was the intended meaning to the original audience and you pull out principles. What is the principle of what's going on in this passage? And then therefore, how does that apply to me? And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see some examples of that as I get into the book of Ephesians. But, you know, this is how we do proper Bible study. These are the three basic rules of thumb. And like I said, we're always trying to bridge that hermeneutical gap between the there and then and the here and now. All right, so now that we've talked about the basic sort of rules of thumb for Bible interpretation or how to study your Bible, I want to talk to you about the greatest tool that you have for Bible study is none other than your Bible itself. And uh, so I want to spend a few minutes talking about Bible translations, how we get the Bible translations that we have, what is the difference between the Bible translations, and why it matters for Bible study. Um, this may come as a surprise to some people, but the Bible was not written in English. Uh, the Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Uh, languages, uh, you know, the, the, and, and ancient forms of those languages. So even if you somehow, you know, spoke modern Greek or modern Hebrew, you still wouldn't have a, a very good understanding of how to read the Bible because the form of the language has changed so, so much over the centuries. Uh, and we'll actually talk a little bit about that next week. And so it was written in, in ancient Hebrew, written in Koine or common Greek, which was the, the common tongue of the time when Jesus and the New Testament was written. And so obviously there's going to be a gap in the sense of what's going on between the original language and what we have in our modern English translation. And that's the word to remember is translation. They're trying to translate as closely as possible what's going on from the original text and start, try to transform that into a, something that will make sense to us in our common language of English. All right? So that's, the, that's the, the, really the crux of what Bible translation is trying to do. Now, if you've been to your local Christian bookstore or, or even really any basic bookstore, you will look on the shelf of the section of Bibles and you will see a plethora of different translations and versions of the Bible. Um, you've got New American Standard Version. You've got your good old standby King James Version. There's the New King James Version. There's the New American Standard. There's the New Revised Standard. There's the New International Version. Uh, there's the version that I use, the English Standard Version. Um, there's uh, what used to be called the Holman Christian Standard. Now I think it's just called the Christian Standard Bible. So, I mean, there's the Living Bible. There's the, you know, the Message. Uh, you may have seen that. And so, you know, there's all these different, different kinds of, of uh, translations of the Bible. And so the question comes up, well, you know, which one should I use? Well, the answer to that is for the most part, whichever one you choose is fine. Uh, most of the English, the mainline English translations that we have are really pretty good translations. And so there's not really... It's really just whichever one you prefer. I mean, most people like the, the New International Version, the NIV, because it's pretty easy to read. The NIV is a pretty good translation. A lot of people uh, like the King James Version. That might have been what they grew up with or uh, you know, what they were raised on, what memory verses they learned. Uh, even with all its these and thous, they, they prefer it because it, it sounds so beautiful. And it is. It's an amazing work of literature as well as the Word of God. And the King James Version, pretty good version of the Bible. The New American Standard has been used in seminaries and colleges for, for decades. Good version of the Bible. I use from, in my personal daily study, and I preach from on Sunday mornings, the English Standard Version. Good translation of the Bible. So I want to encourage you to start off with, you're not, for the most part, if you're using one of the mainline Bibles, you're not going to go wrong. Now, I will put a little caveat in there. If you're using something like the Message Bible... Um, the Message Bible is actually pretty helpful when you're reading in your regular version of the Bible. If I'm reading the ESV and I read a passage that I don't really understand, I can pull out the message and I can read it. And it's a, it's a par what they call a paraphrase version we'll talk about in just a second. And uh, I can sometimes understand better what's going on in this passage after reading the message or something like the Living Bible or the New Living Translation. Those are all kind of paraphrase versions of the Bible. Um, I don't recommend those as your main source, though, or as your main Bible. I think you can use those as sort of a secondary periphery uh, aid to your study, but I would recommend them as your primary Bible because uh, 
the more paraphrased they are, the more further removed you are from the original text and you miss a lot. And there's, uh, there's also some issues of interpretation that go on in there that I'll talk about in just a second. So what happens with Bible translation? And this goes into areas of what's called text criticism, uh, which is basically a whole field of scientific study in, in biblical studies of how languages uh, work and how we have these fragments of scrolls and things from thousands and thousands of years ago and scroll A doesn't match scroll B. Well, how do we figure out which one is the right one? Uh, and then if scroll C over here says something somewhat in between the two of them, well, which one is correct? And so text criticism is the study of how all these ancient manuscripts come together. And so a part of the Bible translation process begins with text criticism because you have to ask the question, well, which text are we using? And uh, there's more than one. There's multiple, multiple sources that they're using of the Hebrew, Aramaic, and the Greek text. Uh, they're, they're different sources. And so that's why, that's really at the heart of why there are some major differences between some of the translations. For example, the King James Version of the Bible uses a whole different set of manuscripts than most of the other modern uh, English translations. Uh, the King James uses something that over time has been called the Textus Receptus, which is Latin for the received text. Um, and uh, unfortunately, as, as much as the King James only people want to make it out that this was somehow, you know, came down on a sunbeam and out of heaven, that's not really how it happened. It was just the latest, greatest manuscript that they had in the time when the King James was composed, which was like 1611. Well, we have found a lot, a ton, thousands of manuscript evidence in the 400 plus years since then. And so the more modern translations, the NIV, I think, was done in the 70s. The New American Standard was probably in the 50s or 60s. And then, of course, it's been revised and updated since then. The English Standard Version, I want to say, came out late 90s, maybe early 2000s. And so a lot of these translations are, are just a couple of decades older, and they're a couple of decades old, and they're using the most recent uh, text versions that we have found that are much older manuscripts. Uh, the, the Textus Receptus, the manuscript that the King James was based off of, was, you know, was being um, composed and, and found manuscripts that were found hundreds of years after Jesus. Well, we have fragments and pieces of, of manuscripts that were found that were within 100 years of Jesus or less in some cases. And so we are finding all the time more and more uh, manuscripts and more and more information, copies of texts that are much, much closer to the original first century uh, writings uh, than what the Textus Receptus, the, the King James Version, was based off of. So you have to ask, well, what text was being used? And, uh, and there's a ton of them. I mean, there's uh, the Codex Sinaiticus, there's Codex Vaticanus. There's, uh, you also have to factor in things like the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of, what, of the Hebrew text, what we call the Old Testament. And it was written around 250 to 150 BC. So, I mean, that's a very old manuscript, as opposed to what's called the Masoretic Text, which was composed somewhere around six to 700 AD. So you've got like a thousand year difference between that. And so a lot of people prefer the Masoretic text, and a lot of translations go with the Masoretic text, but then some actually will go with the Septuagint. And then even recently, in the last hundred years, there was a great discovery called the Dead Sea Scrolls that you may have heard about, or the, from the Qumran community. And there were thousands upon thousands of different manuscripts, not just the Bible, there's actually a ton of them, but a good section of it was the Bible. Uh, and all these ancient Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic texts that were, you know, a thousand years older than the, the Masoretic text. And there are some key differences that some of them that correspond to the Septuagint and some of them that actually go away from the Septuagint and correspond to the Masoretic text. So in a lot of ways, um, you know, and that, that's brought up a whole ton more issues in text criticism. So there's all these things that you, you need to be aware of. And if you look in your Bible, a lot of the modern Bibles, if you look down at the bottom, there's those, you know, there's little footnotes down at the bottom of your text, and in some of these questionable passages, they'll say, they'll ha say, or it says this, and they'll put little things out beside it like LXX. Well, LXX is the Roman numerals for 70, which is the, uh, it's the, the abbreviation for Septuagint. Uh, 
or you might see MT, that's Masoretic Text that I mentioned, or you might see DSS, that's Dead Sea Scrolls. And so when you see those things, that's they're, they're telling you, it's like, well, it says something different in these manuscripts. But what they've put up in the main part is what the scholars that compose this translation feel like they should go with. And so some translations might go with the Masoretic Text, some translations might go with the Septuagint, some manuscripts might go with a different thing. And so you just need to be aware of those things because while you're reading your translation and your, your brother over here is reading something different, and they say, hey, my, my version says something different. Well, that's why, and you just need to be aware of those things. Now, none of the differences, and there are all sorts of what they call variants, and uh, I, I'm not going to go into the whole science of text criticism, but I think I actually did a podcast on that before. Um, but all the variants, and there are thousands of them, but of all the variants, none of them actually affect anything about the Christian doctrine or faith. Uh, a lot of them are just sort of you know minor minor variances in in spelling or um, in word order or uh, they might name the people instead of saying they. A lot of times the Bible just says they, and sometimes it'll, the it'll change it to Jesus and his disciples, so we know who the they are. Well, you know we get that. None of that's going to change anything. There are a few places where things are different where things are, you know, it, it makes a difference how this passage is read. And that's usually where the, the uh, interpreters will put those notes down at the bottom to let you know, hey, we went with this one, but, you know, it could also be this, legitimately could also be this. And so that's why those notes are in the bottom of your Bible as they are. So we need to talk, you know, we need to understand what text they're coming from. And like I said, you know, the, the main difference is King James is using the Textus Receptus, using a certain grouping of manuscripts that the other modern translations are not using. And so just be aware of those things. And that's why there are some major differences, particularly in the Old Testament, uh, between what the King James says and what the English, uh, the other English translations say. Another thing to think about is um, what method. What method are they using? I kind of uh, kind of talked about this a little bit, but are they going with the majority text? You might hear that or read that somewhere. The majority text. If you have five thousand manuscripts and four thousand three hundred of them say it this way in the text, then that's the way I'm going to put it in my translation of the Bible. That's going with the majority opinion. The majority text. Some translations go with the oldest text. So if I have two manuscripts and one of them is from, say, 700 A.D. and the other one is from 200 A.D., well, the 200 A.D. is just, you know, 170 years removed from the time of Jesus, so that's much closer than the 700 A.D. I'm going to go with the oldest translation of what they say. It doesn't matter if there's 5,000 of this and only two of this, I'm going to go with the older one. And so some go with the older in, in contrast to the majority text. Um, and then there's what's called, and I think it's probably the, most, the best and most proper approach to this, is what they call the reasoned eclectic approach, meaning we go with the oldest if possible, but sometimes the majority makes more sense. And so instead of just following one methodology, we sort of look at each individual passage as we come to it and determine, okay, it's probably this in this situation, but over here it might be something else. And then sometimes it might be better in the Septuagint than it is in the Masoretic text. Sometimes it's better in the Masoretic text than it is in the Septuagint or the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so you're really just looking at all of the evidence and trying to come out with the best possible answer for that. And so uh, different translations use different methodologies as well. Ultimately, what this breaks down to is what type of format do they follow? And I'm going to put up another little chart here on the screen so you can see this. Really, it breaks down to this. Okay, There are two sort of schools of thought for how they want to translate the, the Bible into English text. You have what's called a word-for-word -word, uh, translation, which means you are trying as best as possible, one-to-one -one ratio, the English word to the Hebrew or the Greek word, and make it fit in a somewhat readable fashion in English. Okay? So your New American Standard, and that's why it's, it's sort of king in seminaries and colleges, they try to do a one-to-one -one ratio, the word-for-word, your New American Standard is going to be way over here at this end. King James actually kind of follows this word-for-word -word format, even though it's, it's really sort of a poetic uh, in his literature and the way it's organized, but it still follows a pretty word-for-word -word format. 
Now over on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to get what's called a thought for thought uh, translation. And what they're trying to do is, this, particularly in things like uh, idioms or figures of speech, uh, anybody learning a foreign language will tell you the hardest part about learning a foreign language is not the grammar or the vocabulary, it's figuring out figures of speech that are usually culturally relevant. Uh, for, I always like to use the example of kick the bucket. Now, in America, in English, you say, hey, man, my uncle kicked the bucket. Well, you know, we know what you mean. Your uncle died. We got that. But if it's a foreigner who doesn't understand that cultural reference, that figure of speech, and they're learning the language, and you say that, and they might understand the words you're saying, but they don't understand the meaning. They're like, why, why would he kick a bucket? I don't, I don't understand. Well, there are a ton of culturally relevant figures of speech, idioms, or Hebraisms, uh, in the Hebrew Old Testament, but even in the New Testament Greek. Uh, there are a lot of figures of speech and expressions that we don't necessarily get. So sometimes when you're doing a word-for-word -word translation and you read something like, God's nose turned red, you're like, is he Rudolph? What? Well, that's actually a figure of speech for he was angry, like his nose turned red. He's like snorting, you know, flared nostrils, kind of, you know, it's, it's that kind of imagery. Well, you're going to get in a thought-for-thought -thought translation, it's just going to say, God was angry, you know. For example, so you know, so it's not. It's going to make it much easier to understand and read. However, the downside of that is, well, they're doing an interpretation for you by doing this, and so sometimes the interpretation might not be exactly what the Hebrew or the Greek is trying to convey, but it's what the translators thought it might be saying, and they may or may not be right all the time. And so we are fallible in that case, and so. Do you want a word-for-word -word translation, or are you looking for a thought-for-thought? -thought? Um, I recommend, if you're wanting to do serious Bible study, and, and you don't have any access or understanding of how to read the original languages, which most people don't. I mean, I went to seminary, I don't remember how to do that stuff. You know, but you might want a more word-for-word -word type translation, because that way you're at least getting a little more one-to-one -one ratio of what these words in the Hebrew and the Greek were actually saying. If you just want to read the Bible for just general basic understanding, then by all means go with the thought for thought translation. So it really falls on the spectrum of what you're looking for in your daily Bible reading and your Bible study. Um, kind of kind of depends on your your education and background as well, whether you've had any sort of seminary or um, Bible you know school curriculum, anything like that. And so you might be more interested in this as opposed to this. And so it just depends on what your preference are. A lot of people prefer things like the New, Amer New International Version, the NIV, because it's more of a thought for thought. It's a more of an easy to read understanding. Um, I prefer the ESV because it is easy to understand and easy to read, but it tends a little more on that word for word side. It's, well, it's sort of more in the middle, really, uh, maybe more on the word to word side, but um, it's still readable and still easy to understand. Now, on the far end of this thought for thought spectrum are the ones that I mentioned before, like your New Living Translation, your Living Bible, your Message Bible. These are very far end of the spectrum. Uh, these are your paraphrased. Uh, this, uh, this is somebody that said, hey, I'm going to put it in sort of modern English vernacular. This is what this passage is saying. Like I said, you miss a lot of what's going on actually in the passage with that, although they can be helpful for helping you understand. My main problem with a lot of these patches, uh, these translations, particularly something like the message, is that it was done by one guy, uh, Eugene Peterson, I think is his name. Um, one guy did that translation. Well, people are fallible all the time, and I've already seen a number of places in the message where he just completely got the translation wrong, completely. Uh, you know, I mean, he did a great job in a lot of places, but there are some places that's just it's just completely wrong. Well, a lot of these other modern translations, I mean, even your King James that was done way back when was done by a committee, your New American Standard, your, your ESV, your NIV, all of these things were done by dozens, if not sometimes hundreds of well-educated, uh, well-known you know, Bible scholars that were well-versed in the languages and the issues and text criticism and things that go on. And, and even they don't agree. That's why you have those notes at the bottom. It says, hey, you know, the majority of us went with this up here, but there were a few of us that were holding out down here that we thought we might should go with this way. And so that's why you have those notes. But it's better to have uh, 
you know, sort of the, the wisdom of a committee to be able to, to make these choices and see how you can agree on these things. And so that's why I recommend those more so than like, say, the Message Bible. Although, like I said, the Message Bible and things like that can be very helpful uh, in understanding a passage. Just don't use it as your main Bible. All right, so I think I'll wrap it up there. This is, uh, I hope this helps you understand a little bit better about Bible translations and what what to use. I mean, ultimately, um, and really, we are blessed in, in America with the English language to have the wide variety of English translations that we have. It actually helps us better understand. Uh, and I always recommend if you're wanting to do serious Bible study, you know, read from multiple versions. I mean, you know, read from an ESV, an NIV, a King James, an ESV, you know, you know, the message. I mean, pull out four or five different translations to read a passage and try to get it from all angles and then try to understand by doing your study, why they're different and why they, they differ in certain spots. And so uh, certainly do that. But ultimately, just for your regular re reading and study, choose the Bible that, that reads well for you. Like I said, the NIV is a good, solid translation that's easy to read. And for most people, that's probably the best uh, option to go with. If you're a King James guy, King James is a great translation. There's just a few places in there where I think it's wrong. In his translation, but none of those trans—I mean, none of those passages have any any bearing on any major theological issue. So it's not really going to matter. Uh, but it's a good translation overall. I mean, it was certainly the best translation available to them with the manuscripts and the ability that they had back then. And so, you know, King James is fine. I prefer the ESV just because I like the way it reads. And but even it, I've seen in a couple of places as I've gone through, I think it got the translations wrong in a couple of places. Uh, where I think it should have gone with a you know a, di a different sort of route, and so you know if you're doing in serious Bible study, you're going to want to use uh, multiple sources, multiple different Bibles, and uh, and and interact as much as possible as you are able to with some of the original languages. Uh, I'll get into this more when we get into the 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 online Bible study tools in the last segment of this of this series, but. Um, I mean, there you you can type in a passage and type in the word interlinear, interlinear. And uh, you'll pull up the Greek and the Hebrew behind what the passage is. And you, even if you don't know anything about Greek and Hebrew, you can click on those and it'll give you what the actual word meaning was, you know, tied back to sort of the dictionary definition of that Greek word. Um, and it's, it's very, very, very helpful. And so there's a lot. Uh, we're, we're very blessed to have the resources that we have now for, from the Internet and things like that. So... All right, so I'm going to end that today. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about context. Context is king. Context is the most important part of any passage of the Bible. And I guarantee you, you've probably heard that before. But I promise you, you're probably just thinking about the immediate context within the book that has been written. You know, what does the verses say before and after it? I'm going to say that is important, but then the greater context of the whole book, the greater context of the whole Bible, and then something that most people always miss, what was the historical socio-cultural background and context in which you know, produced this writing? And that's the part that we always miss and the part that we have to have serious study for in order to properly understand what's going on in a given passage. And so we'll talk about that next time. Hope you guys have a great week, and we'll catch you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.